Greetings. Welcome to Into the Light. My name is Donald Schmidt, and the title of today's show is Donald's Journey. Sometimes in life, we go through a whole lot of stuff, and I want to take you on where it began and where it is today and all everything in between. And some of you have tuned in, watched some of the shows, and we're thankful here at Into the Light for you doing that. And just today, I, I think that um, with yesterday being Independence Day and today, you know, we, we take, um, we take our, our, our freedom for granted. And um, I've discovered that freedom isn't free. And Jesus paid the price for all of us. So as a result of his death, burial, and, and resurrection, he would take our filthy rags and give us his righteousness, his peace, and his joy. And I, I was born in, um, in June of, of 1954 on the seventh day on a Monday. And I was born, I was born into fear. Um, my mother was always going through things and everything. I don't know about her pregnancy. or I was just told afterwards that um, the day I was born, it was about 10 after 12 in the afternoon, and it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good delivery. And my mother was in bad shape, and I was in bad shape. And the doctors told my parents that I wasn't going to make it. But God intervened and had other plans. You know, in the beginning, when he, when, he made the wor when he made the world, he said, let us make man in our image and likeness. And he took some, he took some wet clay, and he took the clay, and he picked it up, and he breathed the breath of life into Adam. And I believe that that wet lumpy piece of clay became a speaking spirit who was able to say things and things would happen. And Adam had a purpose and God told Adam to name the animals. So Adam had authority in the earth until they disobeyed. So here, am I, here I am in the hospital and I'm not going to make it. And I believe that the same spirit that breathed life into Adam wanted me to be here to share my journey with you. So my mom had a nervous breakdown. I almost died. For 40 years, we blamed each other. I was born into fear. My mother had 10 nervous breakdowns. My grandmother brought me up. My father was my mother and father for a while. And I lived in constant fear, and my mother was always, she was always sorry, saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So it's almost like I was born into the I'm sorry family, you know, and, and there was a lot of, um, I remember I was like five, five and a half, and, oh no, I must have been four and a half. And we lived in Queens over on Leffitt's Boulevard next to the firehouse. And I wanted a dog. And I got the dog, and then the dog peed on the couch, so we got rid of the dog. So my parents said to me, do you want a little brother, or do you want a little sister? And I said, I don't want a little brother or a little sister. I want Blackie, my German Shepherd, back. And that didn't happen. And my sister was born, and she was the first girl in, um, in 57 years, you know, and uh, she got a lot of attention, and, and I didn't like that. I remember going to, um, it was the first day of first grade, and there was a hurricane, and they canceled school. And then the next day, we went, we went to school for the first time, and I went to PS 108, which was in the, the shadows of uh, Aqueduct Racetrack, and I would later go to John Adams High School, which was right in the middle on the right-hand side was the bowling alley. On the left-hand side was the racetrack. So when I was young and innocent, I just knew that there was a, a, 
Um, I wasn't sure what it was. We would go to my uncle's house, who lived in Elmont, and we would, we would drive past Belmont Racetrack, and my parents would get together with all the other um, aunts, uncles, nieces, and nephews, and my Uncle Eddie had a, a basement, and he had a pool table. And my cousin Robert, who was probably three years older than me, uh, worked in a bowling alley, and he had a really good game, and he had like a 279 game. And I wanted to grow up and be like, like cousin Robert. And I would, I would rack the balls up. My sister was young. Uh, a couple of times they would give us money to go to the bowling alley and, you know, just to bowl to keep occupied and everything. And I would rack the balls up. I would hit the balls and, and everything. And I got pretty good at pool. But Cousin Robert got to go to the Kentucky Derby one year. And, you know, he called his parents and let them know he was okay and everything. And I couldn't, I couldn't wait to grow up. You know, and I grew up in the shadows of Aqueduct, and I was, um, I was always around all the people, and my job was to be quiet and get my uncles a beer. And they, they played Pinochle and everything, and they watched baseball and Ballantyne with Mel Allen, and I became a Yankee fan, and, and my grandmother had a black and white TV, and she loved Mickey Mantle, and I used to go shopping for her. Of course, she lived over near Woodhaven Boulevard, and you know it, it, it was pretty. It was pretty cool. I knew it was better to have money in my pocket, so I set up like a little um, messenger business. I would go to the bar after I got out of school. I would see what they wanted. If they wanted a meatball hero or you know a sandwich or something, I would go to the luncheonette. I get 25 cents, 50 cents, or on Sundays I would get a dollar, and and I had I had some pretty good change in my pocket. In the, um, in the middle 1960s. You know, minimum wage was low at the time and everything, and I, I, I wanted to grow up. You know, I just wanted to be able to do things that the adults did, but I didn't know that there came responsibility with it. And I was about, I was about 12, and well, I was in public school for a while, and I had to go to um, a catechism they called it CCD, and we used to get out. We used to get out at like one o'clock on a Tuesday and go to St. Mary Gate of Heaven, and and so we could make our communion. Like when you're eight years old, you make a communion. And I met, I made my communion with with other people. I don't know if I made it at the same time, but the next year they took me out of PS 108 and they put me into St. Mary Gate of Heaven, and I would meet a lot of new people who didn't go to public school. And this past week, sometime at the end of June, was our 50th anniversary of um, St. Mary Gate of Heaven graduating class of the middle school in 1968. And a bunch of us are getting together uh, over in Queens. And we're going to have a dinner. There's going to be about 40, 45 of us. And we're going to talk about, you know, how we grew up. And I know them, I know them for 50, 56 years. And some of them know each other for 59 years because they started in kindergarten. And we're a close-knit group. There's about 65 of us that stay together. Uh, we go on trips and everything. And we stay in touch via emails. And it's been, it's been really interesting because, like, in the interim, I was introduced. I was introduced to alcohol, and I was working in. Um, I was going to Bishop Lachlan High School for a couple of years, and I was with the eldest statesmen. I was like a sophomore, and they were like juniors and seniors. And on Wednesday nights, St. Mary Gate of Heaven used to have bingo, so they needed some guys to set up, and the older guys would set up, and then they would. As they got older, they would pass it off to the young, younger guys. And we'd go, we set up the tables, the chairs, uh, clean the ashtrays, mop the floors, sweep the floors. And we got $2.50 uh, to set up and $2.50 to break it down. And we got a ham and cheese sandwich and a soda because we were too young to drink. But the older guys knew where the beer was, so they used to, they used to hook us up with the beer and 
you know, I used to get $5 for setting up and taking down. I thought it was cool because I wanted to grow up. I wanted to be just like my uncles and everything. And my dad, my dad took me to the track maybe when I was 12 or 13, and I won like two out of three races, two out of three of the races. And um, it was like off to the races after that. I just said, this is it. I have arrived. Easy money. You know, we made money. Daddy was happy. We'd go in. We'd get a, we'd get a beer. We'd get a program. We'd pick a horse. We'd win the race, and we'd go get a beer. I'd get a soda. Or at the time, they had like shrimp cocktails, and they were affordable, maybe a dollar or something, 85 cents. This is like in back 1966. And it got, it got progressive, you know, I liked it and everything, and I turned 18, and I wound up getting a job, and I remember it, it was fun for a while. And I got a job, and I wound up working at the racetrack, and then I lost the job, and I stayed at the racetrack. And it, and it was interesting, I really didn't know a whole lot about God, and I really didn't know about life was a journey. And, and I'm sharing this because it had a beginning, it has a middle, and, and it has a happy ending. You know, I knew, about, I knew about religion, but I didn't know about relationship. I didn't know that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to die for us that we could live. I had read about Jesus and I had known a little bit, but I, I, I knew a lot about other things like candles and altar boys and pretty girls in the first row. You know, and it, it says here in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him, and without him nothing was created that was created. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. I was, I came to Staten Island on July 2nd. 2012, I had gotten out of a homeless shelter. I was introduced to some nice people at CTV. We got a bunch of people together. We had three different shows. I helped my friends out. They helped me out. The show, I didn't have a name for the show. The show's name is Into the Light. So the people who were in the darkness have seen a great light. And Jesus is the light of the world. And there was a lot, of, a, a, a lot of stuff in between, you know, and, and the light of the world came down into darkness and opened my eyes so I could see. And I, I remember the, the greatest thing a, a teacher ever told me that I remembered. It was like I was a junior in high school and Mrs. Yakovlev was teaching English and she said, Donald, in order to have communication, you have to have a speaker and you have to have a listener. And I was all, all busy all the time knowing everything and, and I, I had to learn when not to speak and when to listen. And when, there's a verse that says, um, Lord, make me quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And I always, knew, I always knew everything. I was like a member of the I Know Club. And there was a song that says, I know 26 times. You know, I really didn't know anything. I was like putting on masks and everything. And I was whoever you wanted me to be. I didn't know I was created in the image and likeness of God. I didn't know... I could surrender. I didn't know that I could accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I didn't know that God had made a way where there seemed to be no way. And, and, and then gradually, I'm, I'm in the light. But I was, I was a mess. I had three suicide attempts. I almost died at birth. I almost froze to death. 
I spent eight months in a psychiatric hospital, 15 months in a homeless shelter. I had multiple addictions. I didn't care about anybody but me. And I was selfish and self-centered. I didn't know about volunteering. People recommended it. I didn't want to know nothing. It was all about me, 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 me. And today it's different. You know, I'm, I belong to a congregation, um, a fellowship of, of, of men and women at an um, international Christian center. And we have, um, I learned, I think a very valuable lesson that I learned was living, living in community and living in a common unity and getting people, getting to meet people and know people and, and like people and find out about them. And, and you hear their story and they tell you, you tell them, I tell them my story, they tell me their story. And there was a time, you know, right after Jesus had, had um, risen from the dead and they were living, they were living in community. And community, like, is, um, is a common unity. And they would break bread together and they would, they had a common, they had a common purse. And they would, it says, all the believers were of one heart and one soul. And no one said that what he possessed was his own. But to them all things were in common. With great power, the apostles testified to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was on them all. There was no one among them who lacked. For all those who were owners of lands or houses sold them. And brought the income from what was sold. And placed it at the apostles feet. And it was distributed according to everyone's need. So if they needed something, they would take it out. There was no jealousy. Nobody was any better than the other. It wasn't about keeping up with the Joneses. And they had... Jesus had given them power. He had given them authority. And he told them, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And they hadn't received the power yet. So he told them, listen, go to, go to Jerusalem and wait there and pray. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they were there for a while. And the spirit fell on them. They started speaking in different tongues and everything. And um, I was fortunate enough, it was called the Upper Room, and I got to go to Israel in 2015, and we were in the Upper Room where supposedly the disciples and the apostles were, and it was, it was pretty cool, you know, and God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I went, I, I went from having all these addictions and, and, and just, just crying out to God in a difficult time. And I said, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. And I don't know if you are. But if you are, I need you. And I need you now. And things didn't happen. Things didn't happen overnight. And I didn't know anything about receiving Jesus or asking him to come into my heart and I was in a I was in a Catholic church in Queens on a, a Sunday evening at five o'clock mass and, and I heard whom shall I send and Isaiah said send me and when we look at um, Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, it says the following. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him 
will not be ashamed. And and I said that, but I didn't. I I really didn't know what that meant, and I really didn't know what that entailed. And I was I, I was having a hard time, you know. And and now it's different. And then it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and by faith, I believe He did. And it didn't occur as swiftly as, as I would like, and there was a lot of guilt, bitterness, shame, and, 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 and unforgiveness that I had to forgive myself for some of the stuff that I did, and I didn't know who I was, and I didn't know whose I was. And when I made when I made that decision on that Sunday night, it was a Sunday night. It was a church on Myrtle Avenue, and um, my dad my dad had died a couple of, like six months, seven months earlier. I was having a rough time, and I, I went to this church and I heard the pastor say, "My sheep know my voice, and the voice of another, they will not follow." And I had an altar call. And I went up and they laid hands on me and they supposedly chased some demons out and everything and, you know, they put their hands on my head and always had a guilty conscience growing up. I was laying on that floor that night, that Saturday night, and I knew everything was going to be okay. But I didn't know when it was going to be okay. And guess what? Today, it's okay. And in life, we have to go through things. We have to go through in order to get through. I heard Joyce Meyer said, say, there are no drive-through breakthroughs. You have to go through in order to get through. And I'm discovering on my journey, I'm meeting other people now who are younger that I get to share my experience with them, you know, and I run into people all the time and, you know, I'm, I'm blessed and I didn't want to do the TV show. But when I said yes to God, that meant yes in everything. That meant yes with my time, Yes, with my gifts that he gave me and everything. And yes means yes. And, and I'm here. And I didn't know how to do this before I said yes. And then he equipped me for the journey. And as I got here, I learned more. And I shut my mouth. And I listened more. And I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. But there was a a king and God came to this king and his name was King Solomon and he said you can have anything you want and Solomon had like three million people that he was in charge of and he said Lord give me wisdom and wisdom was the master key that opened the door to everything so I kind of like got a cheat sheet to know, don't ask for money, prosperity, you know, go after my enemies if I had any, to ask for wisdom. You know, there's a lot of information around and a lot of knowledge, but wisdom gives you the ability to put it on that knowledge and it's the wisdom to use that knowledge. You know, because there's, like I said, there's a lot of information and there's not a lot of transformation. And my heart was changed and, and, and I think it was broken and then it was opened and God opened and, and the word was able to get into my heart, which was broken and then sealed up. And then I gradually began to heal because I, I was a mess. I... I would say I, I, I'll forgive, but I won't ever forget. 
and just recently I had to go through um, I had to go through a procedure where I learned how to forgive and I learned how to forget and I cast all my cares on on my Lord and Savior and he makes a way with it where there seems to be no way and it's exciting you know I, uh, I mentioned I got to go to Israel and on another show I'll, I'll, I'll share more about that and I was always I was sitting on a bar stool I had all these fantasies about going all over the world and now I have an opportunity to just listen to that sp still small voice that says this is the way walk in it and I, I wound up here you know and, and I sit before you a free man and a lot of times I, I don't know what I'm gonna say and I don't know what the topic is and but God shows up and he makes a way where there seems to be no way it's it gets interesting at times but don't give up don't give in I had a wise man tell me stay out of your head stay in your feet get out of your way your life is no longer your own and that was so true and that was like 20 years ago you know if you're going through some stuff life will change life can change if you make that decision you know and it's a real simple decision and it's eternal decision you know like eternal separation from God is a really long time and we don't get to eternity by by good works you know we get it because Jesus died for us so we could live and I'm just grateful today to be alive and I'm gonna continue telling this story on another episode and we thank you for watching and you're not alone and make Jesus your Lord and Savior today your life will never be the same. God bless you. See you next time on Into the Light.